Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to EECS 2210. This is our first official lecture after the introductory lecture. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, semiconductor physics and semiconductor devices, the basic principle of operation of these devices. And the reason that we need to do that before actually getting into the circuit analysis and electronic circuits analysis is that, well, generally all the circuits that we're going to discuss in this course and in general all the electronic circuits are based on these semiconductor devices, based on these transistors, different kinds of transistors and diodes and so on. So before being able to analyze these circuits, we need to better know these devices. And to know these devices and their principle of operation, we need to know a little bit about their physics. So in doing so, uh, we are not going to go too deep into uh, discussing semiconductor physics because, well, there are actual courses like such as ECS 3610, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that discuss just semiconductor physics. So uh, we're not going to do that. We're not going to go too deep into like discussing how the semiconductor physics work. Uh, but we're gonna we're gonna need to know enough so that we can actually analyze the uh, or understand uh, the uh, basic principles of operation of transistors or diodes and other semiconductor devices. So the purpose of this week's lectures. Uh, is basically to talk about uh, physics of semiconductors to that uh, depth, let's say. So from basic chemistry, we remember that inside an atom, we have a nucleus and we have a bunch of shells around this nucleus, right? And we know that the last or the outermost shell, we are gonna call it the valence one. The number of electrons in this shell uh, really determines the level of chemical activity of that atom. For example, for a sodium, which is um, of group one uh, on, in the periodic table, we only have one electron. It's actually quite active and it's quite uh, ready to uh, relinquish this electron and basically have some sort of a chemical activity with another atom. Uh, such as chloride, which has like seven of these electrons on the outermost shell and wants to, it's basically an incomplete shell, an incomplete valence shell and uh, wants to be complete. So it takes one electron from sodium, both of them become complete shells and both of them become happy or stable. Um, that's why they're very eager and very active in terms of like basically chemical interaction uh, with other atoms, right? And then on the other hand, so Na or chloride, we both they, they both have like they're pretty active on uh, group one and group seven. We also have uh, gases, inert gases such as neon, right? So neon, we we know that it's an inert gas. It has a complete shell. It has like eight electrons in the valence. Uh, orbit, so it's not going to have any kind of like it's not really interested in having any kind of interactions, chemical interactions with any other atoms, right? And then in the middle, uh, and by middle I mean like approximately middle, let's say group three, four, five, or uh, to be more exact, right in the middle is group four. We have um, elements such as silicon, right, or germanium which have four electrons in the last or the outermost uh, shell of their atoms, right? So you can imagine that for these kind of, uh, so like this is an atom of a silicon, you can imagine that for these kind of uh, elements, uh, we're gonna have a level of chemical interactivity or the chemical um, activity that is basically somewhere between sodium and chloride, which are pretty active, uh, pretty eager to have any kind of chemical activity, and neon or other inert gases that are pretty much like uninterested in having any kind of activity, right? So that's the first observation that I would like uh, all of us to have about these uh, group four kind of uh, material. Um, now, the other thing that we wanna look at is, or I want you guys to remind, uh, to, to remember is that uh, basically if I have this uh, atom of silicon and 
create a crystal with, uh, uh, with many atoms, with many silicon atoms, we're going to have something like this. So I have a silicon atom, and then it's basically sharing uh, electrons with its neighbor atoms in a way that each of them have basically uh, eight electrons in their valence shell. Um, however, these electrons, these eight electrons, four of them are shared with, with other atoms. Right. Um, and then, well, that's why we call this basically the bond between them, a covalent bond. So it's coming from the valence uh, shell, which is the outermost shell. And the co is really trying to remind us that it's, it's a shared kind of a valence um, electron. OK. So the question that comes to mind is that if I have this silicon crystal, which has well, a bunch of atoms with nucleus and electrons, um, and I take this piece of crystal and I connect a voltage across it. Let's say I connect to, to a battery with some sort of a voltage. Let's call that Vx, right? Will I have any current flowing through this piece of silicon, right? So if this was like a conductor material, like, I don't know, copper or gold or something like that, or any of the other metals that we know, we by by just by heart, we could have said that, yeah, it's going to have, it's going to have some current, right? It's a conductor, right? But uh, what about this one? What about silicon? Well, the question is that, well, what does actually constitute a current? Like what does cause an uh, electrical current inside a material? It's free electrons. It's movement of electrons or movement of charge carriers that uh, is going to cause a current for us inside a material, right? Do we have free electrons in this piece of silicon, in the piece of um, silicon crystal? Well, if you think about it, uh, the question can be answered if we know the temperature. So at uh, absolute zero temperature, like uh, zero Kelvin temperature, so at T equal zero Kelvin, um, there's absolutely no uh, free electrons here. Why? Because, well, the electrons are bonded to these nucleus of each atom, and the, the bond is so strong that um, it's, it's just not going to allow the electrons to move freely. So there's not going to be any current. However, if I have a little bit of a thermal energy, and I don't mean to heat up the, the uh, cr silicon crystal, I mean, like, if we put the cr silicon crystal in the room temperature, we don't actually have to heat it up with some sort of, uh, I don't know, with an oven or anything like that. So if we put the silicon in a room temperature, meaning that let's say let's say the room temperature is 27 degrees, that means T equal to 300 Kelvin, right? At this temperature, we know that each electron has a little bit of thermal energy, right? So that, uh, electrons gain a little bit of thermal energy, and it causes them to occasionally break away from the bonds and uh, they act as a free charge carriers at this point, right? So these charge carriers, these free charge carriers are going to move around the crystal until they fall into another incomplete bond, right? So as long as I have these free electrons, I'm going to have the, uh, I'm, I'm going to have some current. So the answer to this question here that what will happen if I, what will happen if I connect the voltage across a silicon crystal, something like this, is that, well, if you have, uh, if you're operating at any temperature above zero Kelvin, you probably have some current, right? But then, well, that causes, or that brings up some subsequent questions, like how much current? What is the relationship between the current and the voltage? And uh, how many of these uh, free electrons will I have? Like, can you quantify the process, right? So we need to actually answer all these questions to be able to actually understand, the, to better understand the semiconductor uh, materials and semiconductor devices. So here I've listed all these questions or all the important questions. The first one is where do charge carriers come from? So like we know that by increasing the temperature, we might have some charge carriers and these charge carriers, these electrons are actually released from the covalent bonds, but are there other ways that we can have some more electrons or other types of charge carriers? Uh, the second question is that what types of charge carriers do we have? We know electrons. Is there anything else that carries charge for us? Um, the third question would be, 
how can we modify the density of charge carriers? So again, we know that if I increase the temperature, I'm going to have more and more electrons. Uh, the question is that, first of all, well, how fast I'm going to have more electrons? Should I increase the temperature? If I, if I want to double the number of electrons, should I increase the temperature by 2 degrees or 4 degrees or 10 degrees, right? Um, because we know that when you're using your cell phone or your laptop, you're not actually increasing temperature to actually have a better performance. So there should be a better way other than increasing temperature uh, to have more electrons and more conductivity in these materials, right? If it's a semiconductor, meaning that it's well somewhere between a conductor and an isolator, if I want to actually uh, control this conductance and the quality of this conductance, I need to be able to actually do it without actually having to change the temperature, right? So what's the other process of uh, modifying the density of charge carriers? And the last one is that how do charge carriers move, right? So like I know that electrons move if I apply voltage across them, but is there any other uh, other kind of a mechanism that uh, re results in any kind of like electron movement or any other kind of charge carrier movement, right? And then I need to quantify this movement, how fast these move this move these movements are going to happen, because well, charge movements means current, and I need to actually calculate current, and I need to know what is the voltage current relationship in these semiconductor um, devices or well semiconductor material in general.